Hi everyone, my name is Marina Garland and I am a senior at College of the Atlantic and I am so excited to share my Belize experience with all of you. The trip that I'm about to describe was part of a tropical marine ecology class taught by Chris Peterson and Helen Hess. After 10 weeks of on-campus lectures, readings, discussions, and project design, our group of 15 departed over winter break for 10 days of experiential education in Belize. But before I tell you why this experience was so important to me and why experiential education is the way to go, I want to first give you a day in the life at Southwater Key, Belize. You are an hour offshore from the mainland and you haven't worn shoes since you first stepped off the boat onto the little island. You wake up just as the sky is lightening to the sound of grackles calling from their hidden perches in the tops of the palm trees. You pull on your bathing suit before breakfast so that you're ready to go for the day. After a breakfast of tortillas, beans, and pineapple juice, you put on the rest of your snorkeling gear, wriggling into your damp wetsuit, fastening a weight belt around your waist, and gathering your flippers, mask, snorkel, and your slate into your arms. It's a minute and a half walk to the south end of the island, where you enter the water from a little spit of beach. The water is 80 degrees. When you slide into the water, you enter a different world, one where you hear little, mainly the sounds of hundreds of fish nibbling on the reef, and the occasional ong, 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 of a toadfish. But what lacks in sound is made up for by sights. Overwhelming numbers of fish, a spotted eagle ray gliding by, waving purple sea fans, and coral everywhere. Though you could explore forever, following one fish and then another, you have a project and a purpose. So you swim your way to one of your observation sites and get your slate ready, marking down the site name and the time. Then you start your observations. You keep your eyes on a little purple and yellow fish, a Spanish hogfish juvenile, who you know to be a cleaner fish, a fish that cleans parasites off other fish for a living. A barjack cruises up to the little fish and stops, hovering, maybe listing a little to one side, maybe doing a headstand. He's asking to be cleaned. You record how many seconds the little hogfish juvenile spends cleaning his client. Next, he cleans a blue tang. Later, you are amazed to see him clean a fierce-looking barracuda. By the time you finish collecting data from half a dozen cleaning stations, you're wrinklier than a raisin. Even the inside of your mouth is pruny. So it's back to the island for a hot lunch and to dry off for a spell. You might climb a palm tree, digging your toes into the grooves of the trunk to inch upward until you can twist a coconut free from beneath the fronds. Or you might sit in the sand and start your journal entry for the day. Then it's back into the salty water for another long round of collecting data. Afterwards, you might play and explore a little bit, tired though your muscles are from propelling you around all day. First, you spot a yellow stingray and follow him as he ripples off across the eelgrass until he finally outpaces you. Then a tiny spotted chunkfish putters along beneath you, and you follow him too until he ducks into a little hole in the reef and disappears. You visit the moray eel lurking in the big fire coral near the buoy. Back at the research station, you dry off again and flip through a species ID book to figure out the names of all the new and strange things you saw today, conferring with Chris and Helen, scribbling away furiously in your travel journal. That night after supper, the residents of the island invite you to go fishing. The moon is so bright that you don't even need flashlights. You learn to swing the weighted hook around in large circles, gathering momentum until you finally fling it far into the water. You wait to feel a bite at your line. Mostly, you just lose bait to fish far cleverer than you. But at the end of the night, you finally haul in a small snapper. This is subsistence fishing only, so you eat what you catch. You learn how to take the meat off the bones and scrape the scales off then bring it home to the kitchen for a close to midnight snack. Finally, you retire exhausted to your bunk after a long day of hard work and hard play. That's my kind of day. That is the kind of environment that I know I thrive in and where I learn the most. For certain subjects, learning by doing, in addition to reading and lectures, is invaluable and much more effective. Compare a picture of a reef squid in a book to the experience of swimming with a small school of them and watching them as they behave seeing with your own eyes how they arrange themselves into one long line in the water, and how, when you get close, one of them divides its tentacles to mimic crab claws and convince you that he's scary. Those kinds of first-hand learning experiences can't happen in the classroom. Who knows, you may realize that snorkeling is not your favorite way to gather field data. For me it was, but you can't find that out unless you try it. Then there's the experience of carrying out your own field study, not just writing a mock proposal about a species that you've never seen before. For me, even with a strong science background, nothing can compare to getting real field experience, learning data collection methods, realizing that data collection is messy, making plenty of mistakes, 
but constantly figuring out ways to improve and always learning in leaps and bounds. Also compare three hours a week of class time to 10 full days of hands-on learning. Some people joked that we were on a tropical vacation, and believe me, I did enjoy the warm water, bare feet, and coconut milk. But our groups did serious work and put in really long days. We were constantly reshaping and improving our research projects. We spent long hours collecting data that was rarely easy to collect, and we transcribed that data every night before bed. Darren Collins, our president, often talks about the aha moment that makes experiential education so important, and I totally agree with him. But for different personalities, it might not be a single aha moment, and I know for me it's more incremental than that. I have been in many of the COA classes that have trips or fieldwork components, and that's because for me, my educational experience is more like weaving together a big human ecological tapestry. Some threads of that tapestry are best added through readings or normal campus classes. But some threads, and often they're some of the most integral ones, can only come from off-campus experiences like Belize, the Georgia wilderness, or Newfoundland. And without those threads, there would be something very important lacking. For me, time in the field is where I most frequently experience that series of aha moments that grow into a greater understanding of who I am and what I want to be doing in the world. Lastly, one of the most important aspects of a trip like Belize for me is the constant awe that one experiences. The awe that was present on every single person's face, regardless of their science background. You're not just seeing a beautiful picture in a textbook. You are watching an octopus hunting at night, changing colors from blue to white and back again as he prowls the reef. You are in the middle of a glittering, undulating school of blue chromis. You are scuba diving 60 feet below the surface and swimming past a barrel sponge that is twice as big as you. Would that we all experience that kind of awe all the time.